In many ways, an abstract is the most important element of an academic paper. So what exactly is it and how can you get it right? Unlike abstraction in the artistic sense, an abstract at the beginning of a research paper should be fully recognisable as an accurate representation of the full paper. The abstract is to the academic paper what a Wikipedia spoiler is to a fiction bestseller. After the title, which tempted you to pick up the article to begin with, the abstract helps you make that decision of whether to continue reading or to move on. A lot is riding on your abstract. It's the academic movie trailer and it has to sell. But you've only got space for about 100 words, so it's a real skill to get it right. And to give you a sense of quite how short that is, I've already said more than 150 words. So what are the necessary ingredients of an abstract? You'll need to tell your reader what your major hypothesis is, offer a quick summary of your method, including materials, apparatus, subjects, design and procedure, an overview of your main results, and finally, what conclusions you draw from those results. It's a lot of ingredients. Another important thing to remember when editing your abstract, particularly if you're submitting your work to a journal, is that along with your title, your abstract will be used for indexing in journal databases. So the more focused your abstract is on relevant keywords, the more chance your work will be shown to people in their search results. That being said, it's critical that the abstract is true to the paper and doesn't sacrifice accuracy for the sake of shoehorning keywords in. If it's not in the main body of the paper, it shouldn't be in the abstract either. So, your abstract is a super precise, expertly captured snapshot of your research. Enough detail for a reader in a database to know whether your research is relevant to their needs, and enough style to encourage a reader to want to read the full paper. Let's take a look at an example. Here's the abstract for Zhao and Rogalin's 2017 paper in Social Psychology Quarterly, titled Heinous Crime or Unfortunate Incident? Does Gender Matter? First up, great title. It's catchy, intriguing, thought-provoking, and it's still super clear as to what the paper's about. So we've been tempted now to read the abstract. This study replicates and extends earlier investigations of emotional displays of an offender influencing jurors' sentencing judgments through identity inference. A clear opening statement. It clears up any possible misinterpretation of the title, and it immediately lets us know where this research sits in the field. Some previous research has been done, and no doubt references will be made in the introduction. This study maintains previously used methods, whilst expanding the scope of study to include gender, as the next couple of sentences continue. Prior studies of this phenomenon used only male perpetrators. However, culturally shared beliefs about emotion are strongly gendered. Thus, we investigate how the perpetrator's gender moderates the relationship between emotional displays and sentencing. So now we know the hypothesis of the study, as well as the measures being used. Results replicate results of previous studies, this time for men and women. Spoiler alert, we know up front what the headline result is. For a little more detail, the authors continue. Furthermore, the effect of a perpetrator's emotional display of distress on observers' judgment of criminal identity is stronger for male than female perpetrators. So now we know that a gender bias was found. But what can we do with this new information? We introduced the concept of the emotion display premium to account for the greater benefits males receive for their display of particular emotions, and discuss the implications of these results for social psychology and sociology of emotions. And now we know. In one paragraph, we already have a very clear overview of the paper and whether it's relevant to our needs. We don't know it all, but we definitely know enough useful information here to decide whether to read on or move on. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend who might also find it helpful. And if it's your first time here, subscribe to Psychology Unlocked and hit that bell so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming videos. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.